Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, on this blessed Sunday, make us worthy to praise your resurrection with pure hearts and with clear consciences. With all the children of your holy church, we glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and your children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the good and merciful Lord, who in his compassion came down to us and became flesh. He chose to taste death to save us, and he descended to the realm of the dead. By his resurrection he gave joy to his disciples, and gave light to the nations with the light of his salvation. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives now and forever. Amen. O Word of God, who can adequately praise you for the depth of your compassion? And what voice can bless you, for you are above all praise. Neither mind nor tongue can describe the wonders you accomplished on Sunday, the day of your resurrection from the dead. And so with the psalmist David we cry out, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Now, O Christ, our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense which we offer to you to forgive our sins, give peace of mind to those in distress, and comfort to those who are anxious. Bring back those who are far, and watch over those who are near. Guide the shepherd, sanctify the priest, and purify the deacons. Pardon all sinners and guard the righteous. Protect orphans and help widows. Drive away conflicts and put an end to dissension. Remember the faithful departed and grant them rest in your heavenly kingdom, that with them we may celebrate that eternal feast. We raise glory to you, to your blessed Father, and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever.
Accept the sweet fragrance of our incense and make us worthy to announce your resurrection along with the angels and to proclaim it with your women disciples and to rejoice in it with your pure apostles. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shout with joy from the mountains, Sunday is a fee so great. Offer praise to the Lord God, and with angels celebrate. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Baruch Mor Arohodilan. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. For you yourselves know that our coming in among you was not without effect. Rather, after we had suffered and been instantly, insolently treated, as you know, in Philippi, we drew courage through our God to speak to you, the gospel of God, with much struggle. Our exhortation was not from delusion or impure motives, nor did it work through deception. But as we were judged worthy by God, to be entrusted with the gospel, that is how we speak. Not as trying to please men, but rather God, who judges our hearts. Nor indeed did we ever appear with flattering speech, as you well know, or with a pretext for greed, God is witness. 
nor did we seek praise from men, either from you or from others. And although we were able to impose our weight as apostles of Christ, rather we were gentle among you, as a nursing mother cares for her children, with such affection for you, we were determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our very selves as well. So, dearly beloved, had you become to us. You recall, brothers, that our toil and drudgery, working night and day, in order not to burden any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and also is God, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we have behaved towards you believers. As you know, we treated each one of you as a father treats his children, exhorting and encouraging you, and insisting that you conduct yourselves as worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and into his glory. And for this reason, we too give thanks to God unceasingly that in receiving the word of God from hearing us, you have received not a word of man, but as it truly is, the word of God, which is now at work in you who believe. Praise be to God always. Praise, glory, honor, Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls. We offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. <clears throat> Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaim life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Luke writes, as they continued their journey, Jesus entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary, who sat beside the Lord at his feet, listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do all the serving? Tell her to help me. But the Lord said to her in reply, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things, but there is need of only one thing, and Mary has chosen the better part, and it shall not be taken from her. This is the truth, peace be with you.
But as we were approved by God that the gospel should be committed to us, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who judges our hearts. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This letter to the Thessalonians, his first letter, St. Paul writes, it's one of his first that he writes. And so it's about the year 51. So think about the same distance between us and 9-11. That is, about, that is practically the same distance between the ascension of our Lord and the writing of this letter. And in during that 20 year time, one of the churches that St. Paul himself had established was a Thessaloniki. And what he says at the beginning of the letter, he says, you know how difficult it was when I entered into you. Here, the, the translation they've been given was our reception among you. But the word in the Greek is actually not reception and the manner in which you received me. He's saying the manner in which I appeared among you. And that is very much linked to the idea how the gospel is proclaimed. It is announced. It is in all kinds of human events that we can look at the question of what we're worried about is what will people say, human respect. And so what St. Paul is insisting on in this second chapter of his letter to the Thessalonians, who clearly he loves very much these people. This is a parish that is very close to his heart. That he reminds them, he says, with a much struggle, because we know from this letter from the Acts, we know that when St. Paul entered among them to proclaim the gospel, the word of God, as things moved along, and especially there were Jews, of course, who embraced the Messiah, and then there were also the pagans who embraced the Messiah. And as more and more of the Gentiles started entering into the church, the Jews started getting more and more angry. They were jealous. And so what happened is they provoked against St. Paul and wound up to the point the, the, uh, the persecution was so terrible and the division was so horrible within that community that St. Paul and Silvanus, his associate for this work, they had to just leave the city to leave, which is why he's writing this letter from Corinth. He's not with them precisely because of these difficulties that had taken place. But what he reminds them about is the question that this is the word of God to be proclaimed. It is the word that is simply announced to you. You accept it or you refuse it. That's the freedom of the individual in hearing the word. But of course, what he's saying to the Thessalonians is you've done brilliantly. You knew that this was God speaking, not some rabbi named Paul, an apostle coming out. But truly you see the fact of what God's transformative word is. Now, when we use the word heresy, and a lot of people don't like the word. Well, and they shouldn't like the word. It has a very bad history to it, doesn't it? But Heresis, heresis in the Greek just means choice. The word's just a choice. And what you can see in this writing of St. Paul to the Thessalonians is the choice that they actually make is to receive this word as being from God, not from man. The faith is something that we receive whole and entire. It's not a discovery. It's not something I make up as I go along. It's not something that I can pick and choose from. As St. James says in his, in his epistle, you follow nine commandments and violate one, you violated all the commandments because you've basically said, I don't care that these are directives from God. I'm going to do this one or these nine because I agree with them, but I don't like this one, so I'm not going to follow it. And so it's the same thing when St. James is saying, in the question of the apostolic faith, the patrimony that is given to us, there are those who desire to pick and to choose. I like this. I like the Blessed Virgin Mary. I don't like the Blessed Virgin Mary. I like the resurrection of the dead. I think that's a stupid idea. And we all know these people who make up their own religion. They can call it anything. They can call it Catholicism. They can call it Christianity. They can call it Buddhism. Whatever it may be, some hodgepodge, which is this self-created thing. 
And the reason why this is also easy to do, especially in the last half of this 20th century, is it's all been that kind of mushy thinking. And the idea was, is I can follow 95% of Catholicism and reject totally the other 5% and still be a very good Catholic. That doesn't work. You've made a choice to renounce part. And if you renounce part, you choose to refuse part of the catechism, you're saying that ultimately you don't believe that the whole catechism is from God, that it's not from God. And therefore, the rest of it you may like only because you agree with it, or it jives with your sensibilities, or whatever. Or it makes you feel warm and tingly because you have memories of being a child at Mass. Who knows? But whatever reason it is to embrace that 95% is not because of faith, but it's because of whatever I choose it to be. And this is the juncture where we talk about having the faith or not having the faith. I remember somebody sent me a link recently. Because, of course, I'm trying to accommodate you as best I can during this pandemic. And, of course, somebody reported us this week to the CDC. I don't worry. They were charming conversations. They really were. So I talked to a lady. The poor thing, she's one of those people hired for contact. But she was charming on the phone. And so we talked. And she just asked. She said, well, we've heard. What do you have? Number of people and all that. So I told her. I told her what we're doing. And we had a very nice conversation. Our subdeacon was there, and at the same time. So we finished, and I thought, okay, fine, we just keep rolling along here. And about an hour later, she called me back, and she said, well, I talked to Dr. Shav. And he said, please try to keep your number at 50, and if you could, also request the masks. So there, I have relayed to you the information you have. I am not going to hogtie you. I am not going to nail you against the wall. And unless they lock the doors, I'm not going to lock you out. But it also means that we're going to do exactly the same thing again as soon as we finish here for the next Mass. It will be the overflow Mass for the other 45 people, 50 people who couldn't come. But of course, the problem that's going to happen here is now I already have, I have Colby kids asking, we can't get to Mass, can we come? When I worked in Switzerland, the area around Geneva, and especially around Lausanne, was always a traffic jam. And the Swiss government refused to build more highways because their, their reasoning was, if we build more highways, you'll just stick more cars on them. We have good mass transit, use it. And so it was always a nightmare driving through Lausanne on the highway. So, of course, what my fear is now that we have an overflow mass to take care of the people who are already here for the last five months is you're going to try to fill up both of the masses again and we'll be back at the square one. I mean, we could obviously easily provide for hundreds of people by multiplying masses all over the place. But this is what we will do for the time being. So as we mentioned, at the end of the Mass, we'll have only about 15 minutes. But since you're not supposed to be visiting in the church anyway, we'll just have you to expeditiously make a Thanksgiving, but expeditiously go outside to visit and let the other, well, I know at least 45 are coming. I don't know how many are coming. But in any case, we try to deal with human words and collaborate and work it is, a, it is an aspect of social responsibility, and so we will do this. But of course, the Word of God transcends all of this. And so we will continue to keep going forward as best we can in order that the Word of God and, of course, the divine mysteries are provided to you. So I thought it was actually quite beautiful that we had the epistle as it was chosen today. Because St. Paul was basically chased out of the parish in Thessaloniki because of a group of people who were furious at the fact that it was growing and growing and growing, but it was growing with the wrong people. Those are pagans. You can't have these Gentiles coming in. Now, obviously, in the end, they got over those hurdles. But it is always painful for the process of growth. But St. Paul goes right to the target, not about human emotions or human conditioning or what we feel like, what we like, whatever, but about what God is saying to us. 
and how he wants us to be transformed. Now the reason why we're bringing this up is I told you that as we do these weeks now with St. Ephraim, I wanted you to understand how St. Ephraim, what was taking place in the 300s. He lived in a century which was continually being knocked in convulsions concerning the faith. Not the persecutions of the previous century where you will die because the pagans will arrest you, but of the arguments that are going on within the church of how do we express this verbally? What are the words we use to express this proclamation of the gospel? Because being human, of course, we like to communicate. We like to talk, probably a bit too much, and we chatter too much, but we like to communicate. We have been given minds to communicate with one another. And so it is a natural desire that you may have in a letter of St. Paul where it says Jesus is Lord. Well, the question becomes is, well, how? And how do we explain that phrase, Jesus is Lord? What does Lord mean? What is the is? How are the two of them linked together? How does it apply to this man who was born in Bethlehem? Because the word Lord, honestly, among the Jews had only ever been applied to God in the old law. Adonai. Now we have being applied to this man who was born in Bethlehem. How? And so in the 300s, the Christians are trying to put words to the faith of the hidden God. How do we explain this? How do we articulate it? How do we verbalize it? And the word verbum in Latin just means word. So our word verbalize just means how do we stick words at what we're trying to communicate? And with that effort, of course, there's going to be a number of faux pas. And they're going to get them wrong. But the apostolic faith is something that is received by each generation and transferred to the next generation if you don't drop the ball. Then your children have the baton and they go in the next generation and your grandchildren will take it into the 22nd century. That's the idea. But of course, if we live in a human manner and think that it's only a human word, then I just start making it up as I go along. Then it's all about my own little personal whims and wishes and so I don't really communicate that to my children because they're not going to have the same faith that I do. And so the real problem that comes in here is we have two main things that are churning around in the 300s is who is the son of God? And what is this thing we keep talking about of being spirit, the Holy Spirit? How, what are they? And so in the 300s you have this constant and fights, I mean real arguments going on over these questions because these are important issues. It's true, if you don't care about God and you don't care about Jesus, then you think it's all stupid because who cares the way you articulate it? The reason why this caused convulsions and for well over a century, these things were not resolved because we discussed and had a synod for three weeks. In dealing with what is the word made flesh, the word, how is the word God? Is the word God? Is the, how does it relate to the Father? These types of things were projected by a man called Arius, who was a very highly respected priest in one of the parishes in Alexandria. And what he comes up with is a whole description about the word being a creature, the greatest and the highest creature that God has made, but there's only the one God. And the fathers of the church, the other bishops, immediately attack this idea. It's, it's refused officially and publicly within, 20 year, within 10 years of it being announced. But does that stop anybody? No. Does a promulgation of a catechism in the 90s make everyone go look in it to see what the church actually teaches? No. They'll just make it up as they go along. And that was the link actually to my CDC conversation this week. If somebody earlier had sent me a link of an article 
from I don't know where, about saying, oh, the majority of Catholics agree with all of the lockdowns and all of the regulations locking us out of mass. Well, maybe that's true nationally. But I wrote back to this person, I said, we also know through polls that the majority of Catholics don't even believe in the Blessed Sacrament. So what? Who cares if they all agree with it or don't agree with it? The, the faith and the practice of the church is not based upon polling. It is based upon the word of our Lord. And the church has never been an office of the state. They are equal entities in human society. In fact, the church transcends the state. But that's for a whole nother sermon. What St. Paul is pointing out here and what takes place during the fourth century is the question is what is the word of God? We're not talking about scriptures. We're talking about what is taught by the apostolic patrimony. What is the apostolic faith that has been bequeathed to me to receive and to be healed by and in order then to share it with others? And as we know with material things, when I share with someone else, there's less of it for me. It's just the way it works with material things. But spiritual things, the more you share them, the more that you are enriched. It is completely the opposite. And when we understand that and why St. Paul is talking about this treasure, that the Thessalonians for the most part had received in such a beautiful way, then he goes on to the whole section of talking about how I was among you and I was simple among you. I was like a nursing mother. Always over you, always finding you, up every three hours, every time you're crying, finding out what you need, taking care of you, doing all these things. And so it's a very beautiful image. But it's important to understand that not only the question that they're arguing over, what is the word? Who is Christ? But also through these 300s, then of course the question becomes, what is the spirit? Is it just a force? Right. Does the spirit be with you mean essentially the force be with you? Which everyone seems to really go for these days because we've lost religion. So you gotta cling on to something to give you some kind of color in your life. So if you drop the apostolic faith, you'll believe in anything. That's why the Curia of Ars famously once said in the 19th century, it says, remove the priests and in 20 years they will worship the rocks. And that's pretty accurate. We get to watch that now. It may be a big rock like Katahdin or little rocks perhaps like crystals, but it's pretty true. He was really on the ball in the 19th century. He knew what would happen. But seeing from your smiles, which is delightful, you understand what this means and the words to articulate the Catholic faith, that these are important. And if you understand that, then you will understand why so much of St. Ephraim's poetry, his writing, is an explanation of the apostolic faith and defense of the apostolic faith against those who will try to mutilate it to their own image. So that is the understanding of the word heresy. The question that comes down is not whether I believe in artificial birth control or abortion or whatever it is that I want to cling on to. It's not about the specific details. It is the core question of whether or not Christ has left behind a sure teaching authority. Is there or is there not in the house of God the ability to articulate and teach faithfully God's doctrine? Well, the Protestants said no. And of course, over the last 500 years, they just continue to splinter and break and splinter and break and splinter and break. Because they said there is no authoritative teaching authority. There is no authoritative teaching in the church. Well, if there is none, well, then your, your opinion is as good as mine and mine is as good as yours, which means none of them have any value in the face of God. It's like in school these days, 
If everyone gets an A, no one gets an A, because the A doesn't mean anything anymore. And if we say that there is no teaching authority within the house of God, within the new Israel, then it's all up for grabs. You can make up any religion you want as you go along. That's the logical consequence. That is the logical results that you witnessed today. So this letter to the Thessalonians is profoundly important. And St. Ephraim's writing in defense of the faith and explanation of the faith are so profoundly important. So I just wanted to take this week to lay out before you really the convulsive state of Christianity. And this era of what we call Arianism, coming from the priest Arius, it was condemned in the year 325. I Meaning mean, they had a council, officially. Pope, everybody was involved in this. And it was repudiated as being an expression of the Catholic faith. And yet, the thing continued to live recognizably for well over a century, even after 325. And at one point, by the late 300s, probably the majority of the bishops in the Eastern Mediterranean had embraced it as an idea. Because the problem of Arianism and the problem of most heresies is that people react to them because it makes sense. I can understand this, that this child born to Mary of Nazareth is also God. How do you wrap your head around that? But if someone comes along and says, yes, but yes, he's the word, but the word is just a really great creature that God used instrumentally to make everything else, but he's not really God. And we have Arians around us to this day. They're called Mormons, they're called Seventh-day Adventists, they're called Jehovah's Witnesses, they still exist, and they teach exactly the same doctrine that was condemned in 325. And not condemned because we don't like Arius, it was condemned because this is an incorrect way to explain the Word of God to explain the apostolic faith, to explain its patrimony. But those convulsions went on throughout the next generations, which are precisely the generations that St. Ephraim lived during. This is his period of time. This is the period of time of St. Marin. And this is why the Maronites throughout the centuries have always been defenders of orthodoxy and correct expression of the Catholic apostolic patrimony. Because the men who founded St. Marin specifically for our church was being buffeted around in an age of great confusion. So you have Orthodox bishops being shoved out of their cities. St. Athanasius was sent into exile no less than five times to go live in desert monasteries, leave the city of Alexandria. And then it swings back and he's back again. And they get driven out again, back and forth. St. John Chrysostom is driven out of his see. When he dies, he dies also in exile. Because when the emperors decide, well, I'll just pick which one verb I want, not following the apostolic teachers, well, then you're at the mercy of whoever has the army. So when the one who has the army decides that we're going to say it this way from now on, oh, you, even though this is a completely orthodox bishop or priest or monk, you die or you get sent into exile, or as they did to the house of the monastery of St. Marin in 500, they burn it down and destroy it to the point where we don't even know exactly where it was geographically because it only stood there for 50 years. But for 50 years, those monks and nuns defended the apostolic faith. They, uh, they defended the integrity of that apostolic patrimony. And it enraged one of the emperors. He slaughtered over 300 of the monks and burned their monastery to the ground and totally erased it from the face of the earth. But guess what? Maronites 
we're still here. They may kill us. They may attack the articulation of the faith, but we hold on to it as the word of God because there is a teaching authority within the church. He who hears you, he's me, our Lord told the apostles. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. And behold, I am with you until the end of the world. This is a major consolation. So hold tight, my friends. Cling to that faith. Ask for the grace to be increased that we always enter into it more deeply so that we can understand even more profoundly the words of St. Paul. That he finishes this part of his letter, that therefore, after all this consideration, therefore, we also give thanks to God without ceasing, constantly, because of your fidelity. Because when you received from us the word of God, the word of the hearing of God, the auditory, the hearing of God, you received it. You received it not as the word of man, but as, as it truly is, he says, as the word of God. And it's that word, he finishes by saying, that word, which is now at work within you, transforming those who believe. May he intercede for us and obtain for us that great love of the gift that has been given to us. And may his prayers be a rampart to us always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from the light, true God from true God, God from my King, Confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Itelvot madem heid aloho, walvot aloho dam chade tayo. Reinem zilvot aigu tao keulel baitoch beskudem chayet mo. 
Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, Saints Mary and Saint Jude and Blessed Estefan. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of St. Peter, Chief of the Apostles, on page 774. 774. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. O Father, God of peace and Lord of security, make us worthy to embrace one another with a sincere kiss in the spirit of your unending love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. 
peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor, love and faith that are pleasing to God. blessings and assistance for we are weak and you are the support and refuge of all we raise glory to you to your only son and to your holy spirit now and forever Amen. O lord may the light of your face shine upon us deliver us from every evil and blot out all our transgressions that we may raise glory and thanks to you to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Truly, it is right and just to glorify and exalt You, O Maker of all creation. With the angels, we glorify You, and with voices of praise. We cry out and we proclaim. abundant in mercy. Because of your love for us, you sent your Son into the world, and he became flesh of the Virgin Mary for our salvation. O Barahu Kadeh, Waksu Yabil Talmita Karamara, Sabahu Lamene Kulhu, Hono Denita Fahuru Dia, Dahlu Faikun Wahlab Sagi. O 
kanna alkoso damsiko men hamro men mayo barakho kadesh yagal talmita kadomar sabishta wa mehne kul kho hono denita Demain, dit lundi, un tiki redaton. Dachle faikon, wachle sagie, te shadow meti. Hos mouyon, hau me wo hoye, dan alam alamin. Then commanded and instructed them, saying, Each time you celebrate these holy mysteries, you remember my death and resurrection until I come again. Remember your coming that saved us, and as we await your second coming, we offer you praise and ask you. On the day when you will judge the righteous and sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins, but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your holy face away from our sins and assist us. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you, Implores your father saying, Have mercy on us, O great Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. Since he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May those who share in these holy mysteries be cleansed body and soul from every sin and receive eternal life. O Lord, accept our intercessions and prayers and grant security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect our shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John, our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church so that they may intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord Remember, O Lord, those who have asked us to pray for them, those who desire but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. Be a shelter and a refuge for them, for you are the Savior of all. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders in our country and throughout the world. Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have 
Remember, O Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. Remember those who diligently carried your gospel throughout the world and confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, our parents, brothers and sisters, teachers, and all the faithful departed here and everywhere who have gone to their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all offense, sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. O Lord, you are the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself for us the Lord. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you, to be you be glory. O God the Father, you strengthen and encourage us, for we are weak. We implore you to purify us from every sin and to accept our offering, so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, O Lord, lead us not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. O Lord, bless your worshipers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive their sins, for you are almighty and rich in compassion. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, 
and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy blood, and our souls purified by your forgiven blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.